Welcome to the MPO Governing Board Training on Congestion Reduction, Module 3. I am your host for these training modules, Wayne Garcia, and today we're talking about traffic congestion with Taylor Deinhardt, a researcher at the Center for Urban Transportation Research, as well as the National Institute for Congestion Reduction. Thanks for joining us today, Taylor. Yeah, my pleasure. I'd like to mention quickly that these training modules have been funded through the National Institute for Congestion Reduction and is presented by the faculty at the Center for Urban Transportation Research at the University of South Florida. Additionally, the Association of Metropolitan Planning Organizations, Florida Metropolitan Planning Organization Advisory Council, and the National Association of Regional Councils each contributed staff resources as a member of the Project Advisory Committee, which provided guidance throughout the creation of these modules. Now, we learned in the first presentation of this series, traffic congestion has been a problem in the United States even before the motor vehicle was invented. Before cars, people found themselves waiting in traffic alongside stagecoaches, wagons, streetcars, and pedestrians. Today, we're going to talk about congestion in the modern world, including the causes of traffic congestion, various impacts of traffic, and whether there are any benefits from congestion. We'll also talk about some strategies for managing congestion. So, Taylor, what exactly is traffic congestion? Why does it happen? Basically, congestion happens when travel demand, which is the number of vehicles on a certain road at a given moment, exceeds roadway capacity, resulting in travel speed that is lower than normal. Congestion doesn't only happen on roadways, by the way. Any type of transportation facility can be affected by congestion, sidewalks, airways, railways, airports. When demand for their use exceeds their capacity, you get congestion. One important concept to keep in mind when thinking about congestion is that it is increased demand at a particular time and place, meaning if everyone spread out their travel needs evenly throughout the day, we wouldn't have congestion. Likewise, if during peak travel times, trips are spread out across the entire road network of a city, or better yet, spread across different modes of travel throughout a city, we wouldn't have congestion. That seems simple enough. Well, it's just a little bit more complicated than that. There are different types of congestion, and this becomes important later on when we get into how to mitigate congestion. Different types of congestion needs to be tackled in their own separate way. Now, there are three basic types of congestion, recurring, non-recurring, and congestion caused by physical roadway features. Recurring congestion happens regularly, every Monday through Friday, for example, and it's anticipated by the travelers that use the affected roadways, uh, buses, ferries, subway lines, etc. Think morning and afternoon commuter traffic. This type of peak hour or rush hour congestion is the result of high volumes of travelers using the same roadway or transportation system at the same time. Non-recurring congestion is usually unexpected. It's often caused by crashes, vehicle breakdowns, road construction activities, special events, extreme weather, those kind of things. There are also physical roadway features which can influence congestion, sometimes as an unintended side effect and sometimes on purpose to increase safety. For example, control measures like railroad crossings, toll booths, traffic signals, and merge areas at interchanges are all physical roadway features that cause congestion, but slowing traffic isn't necessarily their purpose. On the other hand, traffic calming measures such as bulb outs, speed humps, and lateral shifts in the roadway are usually intended to slow traffic. Wait a minute. Why would we want to purposely slow traffic down? Well, to increase safety in that location. When traffic calming measures are added to areas identified as unsafe, we can reduce collisions and improve safety for pedestrian cyclists and transit users. These measures can also increase pedestrian and bicycle activity, which helps decrease congestion by spreading people to other modes of travel. Okay, so now I understand what traffic congestion is and what causes it. But now I'd like to know the so what. Besides getting kind of irritating to people stuck in them, what are the major impacts of these traffic jams you just described? Well, the impacts of congestion are wide-ranging and complex, but can generally be grouped into five categories. Commuter costs, freight costs, environmental and public health costs, safety costs, and reduced economic competitiveness. To the commuter, meaning the average traveler, The cost includes lost time, wasted fuel, increased vehicle maintenance, lack of travel time reliability, and increased stress. Yeah, I have to stop you there. 
lost time and lack of travel time reliability is something like the same thing to me. Can you explain what those two terms mean? Yeah, absolutely. When I say lost time, I'm referring to the minutes and hours that the traveler could have been doing something else, like working, sleeping a little extra, completing personal errands, but instead are spending time on travel. Lost time may result in direct monetary impacts, like paying a penalty fee for being late to daycare pickup. The Texas Transportation Institute in 2019, uh, their urban mobility report, calculated that all that lost time and fuel added up to about $1,000 per average commuter per year. Lost time also means time that could be spent on more pleasurable activities, such as pursuing a hobby, spending time with family and friends, or just relaxing. Since our time is finite and non-refundable, the cost of those opportunities goes beyond the monetary. Now, lack of tra travel time reliability. This is a measure of the consistency or dependability of travel time of a trip. For instance, traveling to the airport from your home might take as little as 15 minutes but sometimes it takes 40 minutes due to traffic disruptions. On the day that you need to travel to the airport, you might not be sure what kind of day it's going to be, 15 minutes or 40. So since there's a lack of travel time reliability, to be safe, you give yourself 40 or 50 minutes to get there, whether you need it or not. Travel time reliability is an important measure for commuters, transit riders, shippers, uh, other road users, because it allows them to make better decisions regarding the use of their time. Unreliable travel time forces road users to plan for extra time to avoid late arrivals. The last thing I want to mention about travel time reliability is that you can have reliably congested roadways, like your normal peak commuter traffic in the morning. In this scenario, you're definitely losing time, but you don't lack travel time reliability. Likewise, you can have zero congestion but still lack reliability. A good example of this is if you live in a place that snows. Perhaps during the winter on a clear day, you can drive the speed limit all the way to work and it takes you 10 minutes. When it snows, there is still no traffic, but since the roads are more hazardous, it takes you much longer. For freight, again, we see lost time and wasted fuel costs, but additionally, there are increased shipping costs resulting in higher costs passed to consumers, negative impacts to the supply chain, and again, that lack of reliability in pickup and delivery times. We know that traffic congestion increases vehicle emissions and degrades ambient air quality, and multiple studies have shown excess morbidity and mortality for drivers, commuters, and individuals living near major roadways. In fact, research has now made it clear that the air pollution mixture produced by vehicles, especially vehicles slowed or stopped by congestion, contributes significantly to premature death, especially from heart disease, cardiovascular disease, and lung disease. According to researchers out of Harvard School of Public Health, traffic congestion contributes to thousands of deaths per year and a monetized public health impact of about $31 billion per year nationwide. On a grander scale, in 2020, transportation accounted for the largest portion of total U.S. greenhouse gas emissions at 27%. This total is largely made up of light-duty vehicles, like passenger cars and light-duty trucks, as well as medium and heavy-duty trucks. In other words, all those vehicles you typically see on the road are producing about 22% of all greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. And as traffic congestion increases, fuel consumption and CO2 emissions increase right along with it. All this matters because greenhouse gases damage the environment and contribute to global warming. Sounds really significant. How do those numbers compare U.S. versus other countries? The only other country that produces more greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. is China. We produce over 13% of all greenhouse gas emissions on Earth. But the U.S. has a plan to reach net zero emissions by 2050, and we can help by mitigating as much as possible through congestion reduction. As far as safety is concerned, there are a number of unique effects congestion has on safety. The first I want to mention is aggressive driving. Aggressive driving, speeding, and road rage are more prevalent during periods of congestion. Aggressive driving entails driving in a reckless way that endangers others. For instance, tailgating, driving along a road shoulder, or intentionally blocking other cars from passing or merging. According to statistics from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration's Fatal Accident Reporting System, Aggressive drivers play a role in 56% of fatal crashes. The next effect that congestion has on safety, which may seem counterintuitive, is congestion increases the frequency of crashes. While vehicles technically move more slowly in congestion, there's a high speed variance among vehicles and between lanes, erratic driving behavior, and stop-and-go traffic conditions, which all lead to more crashes, especially rear-end collisions. 
Also, congestion increases emergency response times. The ability of first responders, police, firefighters, and EMTs to get their intended location is absolutely degraded by congestion. One study out of Alabama stated that traffic congestion on average resulted in an increase of 8.3 minutes to EMS response time. This is the total time it takes an emergency vehicle to reach the emergency and arrive at their destination like a hospital. Given that risk of death increases by 5% for every minute that goes by between the occurrence of an injury and the arrival at a hospital, an additional 8.3 minutes for EMS due to traffic congestion increases the expected mortality rate by 48%. Another study out of California that focused on fire department response times caused by congestion found that the annual damage from traffic on fires ranged between three to $26 million in urban areas in California. That doesn't even include the damage done by wildfires in rural California. Finally, there's the cost of reduced economic competitiveness. Congestion can play a role in the stifling of economic competitiveness in a city or neighborhood by limiting workers' access to viable jobs, limiting employers in attracting specialized workers, and limiting potential customers. A 2018 study by the University of Minnesota showed that during a typical morning peak congestion period in Minneapolis, there was a 41% reduction in jobs accessible within 10 minutes of where a person begins their commute and a 39% decrease in jobs accessible within 20 minutes and then a 26% decrease in job accessible within 30 minutes. Simply put, a person living 20 miles away from an area that is rich in employment opportunities may consider applying for a job there if there were no congestion. But with congestion, the commute time could make applying to that area unreasonable. Another aspect of economic competitiveness involves the geographical reach of business markets. What this means is without congestion, a business may attract consumers within a certain geographical net, but congestion and its associated transportation costs shrink the geographical net and the number of potential consumers along with it. After listening to your explanation of those impacts of traffic congestion, it, it, it seems as though traffic congestion is always undesirable. I know it is for me. Am I understanding that correctly, or, or are there benefits to congestion? Well, usually, and rightfully, the term traffic congestion is associated with negative effects, like the ones I just listed. But there are reasons to see certain types of congestion as having value. For instance, streets and roads that have high volumes of traffic can indicate a strong economy or a vibrant and desirable community. In fact, many of the cities recognized as the most congested in the U.S., such as Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, Boston, they're considered by many to be among our best and most dynamic cities. But to be clear, traffic congestion is not what makes these spaces vibrant and dynamic. People, jobs, and desirable destinations do that. Congestion is the unwanted byproduct of getting people to these places. But there are two positive outcomes of congestion. First, when vehicles are forced to travel at slower speeds, pedestrians and bicyclists experience a higher degree of safety. An example of this is the traffic that occurs in areas near schools when children are released for the day. We don't really want fast, free-flowing traffic where children are attempting to cross the street or ride their bikes home. In those locations, there's often congestion caused by high volumes of parents all using the road at the same time to pick up their children. But often, municipalities will also purposely employ traffic calming measures at these locations to further ensure vehicles are slowed and the chance of death or injury is reduced. These measures can include things like reducing the speed limit during certain times of day, adding stop signs or traffic lights, employing crossing guards, and installing speed bumps or other physical measures which result in slower traffic. Additionally, congestion in these locations usually encourage people who are using this road as a through straight to use a different route altogether. This is good for parents and teachers who otherwise would be competing with through traffic to negotiate this space. This concept applies to any place where the goal is to make the roadways safer for pedestrians and bicyclists, such as shopping districts and central business districts. And slowing cars down when pedestrians are around makes a huge difference when it comes to survivability. When a person is struck by a vehicle going 20 miles an hour or less, the injury is typically survivable. However, as speeds increase, the chances of survival for pedestrians decreases. When struck by a vehicle going 40 miles per hour or more, 80% of the time the pedestrian is killed. This is a key reason traffic calming measures are pursued in areas where pedestrians and bicycle traffic are either already present or there's a potential for those modes of travel. The second benefit I wanna mention is how congestion incentivizes adaptation. Studies have found that congestion can act as an incentive for infill development, living in a location efficient place, walking, 
biking, transit use, ride sharing, and innovations in urban freight. When people are faced with high levels of traffic congestion in a desirable location, they tend to adapt by switching to other travel modes. Okay, I think now I have a firm understanding of what traffic congestion is and what it means for my city and region. I get that in some ways congestion can be useful, but it also seems clear that many places traffic congestion affects the city and community negatively. As an MPO board member, I need to know what I can do to reduce the bad kind of congestion and the negative effects that it brings. So how do we do that? What are our options? Well, that's the million dollar question. Luckily, transportation planners, engineers, and other professionals have been studying exactly this topic for years and have had the benefit of analyzing the successes and failures of congestion mitigation measures around the world. You have a menu of options at your disposal that can be used to build a congestion reduction strategy. And I say strategy because there's no single fix for congestion. A combination of mitigation measures should be chosen to address the specific area and specific type of congestion in that area. It's important to mention that rather than a one-size-fits-all approach, strategies used to address congestion should be tailored to the land use context where the congestion is happening. You aren't going to use the same tools in densely populated high pedestrian area as you would on, say, Capitol Beltway, for instance. Also, care should be taken to ensure that the solutions are aligned with the needs and aspirations of the residents who live and work in these environments. There are too many examples of neighborhoods being degraded or destroyed in pursuit of unimpeded traffic flow or through traffic. And solutions should be thoughtfully targeted to underlying causes. You can think of congestion as the symptom of a disease, like a sore throat or fever. We don't want to throw cough drops at the problem. We want to identify and alleviate the root cause. Accomplishing these goals require careful consideration and varied perspectives. There are a number of ways planners categorize congestion management strategies, but for simplicity's sake, I'm going to separate them into four major categories. Managing existing capacity more efficiently, encouraging travelers to use a system in less congestion-producing ways, using land use patterns that produce less congestion, and adding multimodal system capacity. I'm going to put a spotlight on each one of these groups and go over exactly what they mean and how and when they should be used. As I do this, it's important to remember that while it is tempting to consider the individual strategies, many of these strategies have multiplier effects when provided in combination. I noticed you said adding multimodal system capacity, which I assume includes adding roadway capacity. From what I understand, as far as adding capacity, since I want to say the early 1960s and continuing on to today, traffic engineers and planners uh, I've read have made it clear that this doesn't work, that something called um, induced demand actually takes traffic worse over time. Because when you increase the free supply of something like roads, it encourages even more people to use it. We love free. It's interesting that uh, this is on your list. You're 100% correct. The traditional strategy of adding capacity often only serves to exacerbate congestion problems along with all the negative side effects of congestion that we discussed earlier. But this category is about much more than just roadways. We're talking sidewalks, bike lanes, bus routes, streetcars, bus rapid transit, light rail, heavy rail, ferries, things like pedestrian crossings, bus shelters, bike parking, ADA compliant curb cuts, and intermodal connections that make switching from one mode to another as easy as possible. There are a ton of instances where adding system capacity is exactly the right answer as part of a greater strategy, as long as those important questions are answered. Does it fit the land use context? Does it align with the needs of the residents? And does it target the underlying cause of congestion? Okay, I see. I get it. So uh, tell me more. All right. So using existing capacity more efficiently. In recent years, transportation agencies have embraced strategies that optimize the operation of existing highways, transit, freight, and multimodal systems rather than just building new infrastructure. In the transportation world, this is called TISMO, which stands for Transportation Systems Management and Operations. TISMO initiatives have gained a lot of momentum in the last 10 years because TISMO strategies are often quicker to implement, low cost compared to traditional infrastructure solutions, often have limited or no environmental impacts, and can enhance the customer experience. And since it addresses system performance from a holistic and multimodal perspective, it can create efficiencies over time. Is TISMO just about using new technologies to solve transportation issues? Uh, is it just another name for what some of us know as ITS, Intelligent Transportation Systems? No. While TISMO is positioned to take advantage of the new hotness in technology, and many TISMO strategies have a significant technology component, 
that's actually only a portion of what TISMO is about. And ITS is just one of the many tools that can be used to accomplish TISMO activities. Think of TISMO as a process where performance is analyzed from a systems perspective, and then solutions are devised to improve the system, ranging from something as simple as installing a static road sign to something more complex like developing a phone app with live information about parking availability and pricing for travelers. What you see here are just a few examples of TISMO strategies. Do you have any real world examples of TISMO being used uh, to make uh, places a little more clear? Oh yes, uh, transportation agencies have been rolling out TISMO initiatives for years now, so there are quite a few examples to pull from. A good example to start with is a fairly straightforward one, managing traffic flow through signal timing. In 2013, Operation Greenlight was established in the Kansas City region to improve the coordination of traffic signals and incident response on major routes throughout the region by synchronizing traffic signals on major streets, especially those that cross city limits. The program operates 750 signals through an advanced traffic management system, ATMS. And since it runs off a wireless communication system, traffic analysts can make changes and resolve issues quickly and remotely. The result of this initiative has been a marked reduction in unnecessary delays, improved traffic flow, and a decrease in vehicle emissions along those corridors. Another interesting example is Interstate 40 in Knoxville, Tennessee. In 2016, the Tennessee DOT's Regional Traffic Office noticed a spike in crashes along the major east-west interstate, which caused road closures and congestion for hours at a time. They used various methods to analyze the crash rates, locations, and factors which contributed to these crashes. They determined that a combination of hazardous conditions during wet weather and an excessive number of conflict points where vehicles had to maneuver through lanes to either exit off the interstate or merge onto the interstate contributed to the problem. A plan was devised to change the exit lane configurations, resurface the road with a type of pavement that has larger voids on the surface layer, which allows water to drain more easily, and to install new signage and route shields, which emphasize the new conditions and further help road users determine the proper lane for each maneuver and destination. The result was a marked decrease in congestion, as well as a 37% decrease in crashes. The entire project was completed for $2.3 million. When you approach congestion management from the TISMO mind frame, from the mindset of using careful analysis, resourcefulness, and ingenuity to find a way to use existing capacity more effectively, there are really a ton of options. One great resource for this is TTI's How to Fix Congestion tool, which you can find on their website. The URL is listed on the top of this page. You can pause the video and take a second to browse their solutions if you like, or jot down the web page to look at later. The second type of congestion mitigation measure I'm going to talk about is encouraging travelers to use a system in less congestion-producing ways. This method is often referred to as Travel Demand Management, or TDM for short. The goal of Travel Demand Management is the same as TISMO to increase the overall system efficiency of existing transportation facilities and services. But the methods are a little different. Transportation demand management aims to accomplish this objective using policies, strategies, and programs that change traveler behavior or the way people travel. There is some overlap with TISMO and TDM, but for clarity's sake, I'm going to explain them separately. Some of the benefits of TDM methods are that they are often incredibly cost-effective, even more so than TISMO. In fact, TDM can sometimes actually generate revenue while also lowering capital and maintenance costs. TDM methods are often very flexible in their ability to provide tailored solutions for a particular time, place, and situation. These solutions are often easily movable and removable depending on the need of the community at any given time. Most TDM solutions provide the public with more choices and more opportunities to save time and money. And TDM can help achieve and support both equity and sustainability objectives for the community. So what exactly does it mean to change traveler behavior? What does that look like? Well, for one thing, it can look like disincentivizing driving alone. Maybe encouraging more sustainable alternatives like transit, rideshare, van pooling, biking, or walking. We could reduce travel during peak periods by creating variable work hours or offering the availability of telecommuting. We could even encourage people to take different routes to spread vehicles more evenly across the transportation network versus everyone crowding onto one primary route during peak times. I'll give you a couple examples of how some cities are using TDM methods right now. In 2011, the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency began a pilot for a program they called SF Park. The goal of this project was to use smart pricing and user-friendly apps to, one, price parking spots in a way that more evenly distributed parking by block, Two, 
show drivers live and accurate pricing and availability of parking every eight weeks or so. SF Park made minor adjustments to meter and garage parking prices to match demand. The pricing technique encouraged drivers to park in underused areas and reduce the demand in overused areas. The pilot project ended in 2014, but the program was so successful, it continued on today. So what was so successful about it and how did it improve congestion? You had a chance to ask yourself before I could ask you, so how was it a success? Over the lifetime of this program, parking availability improved, meaning drivers were more likely to find an open parking space near their desired destination. Drivers were spending less time circling and circling around blocks looking for parking, which meant, first of all, less frustration, but also a clear decrease in congestion and a decrease in greenhouse gas emissions. Also, average parking rates decreased. The average hourly rate at meters dropped by 11 cents per hour, and average hourly rates in garages dropped by 42 cents. Pricing parking according to demand saved drivers money. Another interesting side effect of this program was that bus speeds improved. This happened because when people were quickly able to find suitable parking spots, drivers were less likely to get frustrated and just double park when they couldn't find a spot close to where they wanted to go. With double parking reduced, transit had fewer unpredictable delays and operated more reliably. How is this an example of changing the behavior of travelers? Well, for one thing, since travelers could see before they even left their homes the price, availability, and location of parking, they could make informed decisions about whether driving was the best option for them. If you know it's cheaper and less time-consuming to take public transit, walk, bike, or take your scooter or use rideshare, you do that instead of drive. That's a behavioral change. Also, prior to SF Park, drivers circled blocks looking for a place to park for 11 minutes on average. Since drivers using the SF Park app know exactly where parking is available, no circling is necessary. And instead of wasting time waiting for that perfect spot to open up right in front of their destination, Drivers could decide to save their time, money, and sanity by parking in a competitively priced parking garage and walking a short distance. That's a behavioral change. I'll give you one more quick example of TDM before I move on to land use because it's kind of interesting for a couple of reasons and it's worth talking about. In 2020, Intercity Transit in Olympia, Washington tried out a project they called Zero Fare. Their reasoning was pretty simple. They were in the process of purchasing new buses to replace buses that had been used beyond their expected service lives. The fare boxes they had been using were obsolete, so they were going to have to expend significant resources replacing their old fare technology with something new. After considering the capital and operational cost of the new systems, they realized that they would actually be saving money in the long run by skipping the new fare boxes and letting people ride for free. This decision also took into account the desires of the community after voters approved a sales tax increase to maintain, improve, and expand public transit. Ridership increased when zero fare took effect, which means Traveler behavior for this area changed. Some other cities that have made the switch to zero fare include Kansas City, Missouri, Richmond, Virginia, Missoula, Montana, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and Alexandria, Virginia. Many of these cities are still evaluating the long-term effects of going zero fare, but so far the results are encouraging. Each transit agency noted a marked increase in transit ridership, a reduction in congestion, an increase in parking availability, and a decline in security issues. That is interesting. Uh, I would think that if you let everyone on the bus with this zero fare program and more people were riding daily, you would get more conflicts on the bus, not less. Yeah, I know what you mean. But the Kansas City Area Transit Authority found that most negative incidents prior to zero fare had involved passengers who couldn't afford to pay or refused to pay. Once fares were free, there was much less to fight over. Now that is interesting. Right. The Kansas City folks learned a few other things with this program. Allowing travelers to board and disembark without stopping in a fare box meant quicker boarding times and faster service. Also, travel demand models for Kansas City suggest that increased ridership due to zero fare transit service reduced annual carbon dioxide emissions by 7,000 tons. When transit riders in Kansas City were surveyed about their experiences after going zero fare, many of them said that they had greater access to grocery stores and were able to shop for quality food more often. They could see their health care providers more often and were able to get and keep jobs. And many felt that the city leadership were concerned about their needs. The next broad category of congestion mitigation measures is all about land use. The way we design our cities have a huge effect on congestion. And this is a good thing because we can use what we know to design spaces that use the transportation system in a less congestion producing way. Some examples of this include allowing for and encouraging mixed use development, infill and densification, and transit oriented development. That makes sense to me. I mean, if people can step out their front door and be within easy walking distance to parks, shops, restaurants, cafes, maybe even where they work, 
then there isn't much of a need to get in your car and add to all that congestion. Exactly. And if you add in easy access to transit, even less reason to drive. You can walk to most places you want to go day to day, and for places that are further away, you hop on your mode of choice. And then finally, we get to the last general category of congestion mitigation strategies, and that's adding multimodal system capacity. The first thing I want to mention about this is if you want to serve your community, you've got to have a firm understanding of multimodal transportation demands for that community. You know, for the typical community, about 20 to 40 percent of the residents don't drive, maybe due to age constraints, economic reasons, or disability. This is coming from the U.S. Census. But there are also people who do drive but don't want to or shouldn't, like people who are drunk or on drugs, people who have cognitive impairments, people who are just nervous to drive for their own individual reasons, or frankly, people who simply prefer walking, riding a bike, or taking transit. You really have to find out what the community needs and wants. And then you add those multimodal options. Exactly. For every person that chooses to walk or bike or take the bus rather than drive, that's another car off the road and a decrease in potential congestion. But they need sidewalks, bike lanes, and bus routes for that to happen, right? Yeah, you got it. If the infrastructure is already in place, part of this strategy also involves checking for gaps and then filling those gaps. Another aspect of this strategy is enhancing and expanding the multimodal options that are already in place. What actions can you take to further make people comfortable choosing various modes? And then making sure these modal networks are connected to each other. What do you mean by that? Well, for people who want to ride transit, for example, they need to be able to safely, efficiently, and comfortably get to those transit stops. You've probably seen a bus stop that is just a pole sticking out of some grass. How are people getting to this stop? And once they get there, how comfortable is their weight? If you want to encourage ridership, you really need to integrate intermodal system links. So is there anyone doing this really well? There's a bunch of places out there that are doing a really good job. One that springs to mind right now is San Antonio. First, the MPO that serves San Antonio is AMPO. And in their MTP, an overarching goal they identified is to increase the efficiency and reliability of the transportation system, encourage alternative modes of transportation and transit to reduce the use of single occupancy vehicles, and continue to manage traffic congestion. Then there's VIA, which is the mass transit agency that serves San Antonio. In 2011, they established a program called the Next Gen Shelter Program, through which they have outfitted more than 1,000 bus stops with shelters and ADA-accessible sidewalks, which means San Antonio bus riders now begin 95% of their trips at an accessible stop with a shelter. It seems like a number of the other strategies you've already mentioned involve beefing up these multimodal systems. That's true. Yeah, actually, there is a lot of overlap across the board here. And there are some examples I've talked about already that could fit into all four categories, perhaps. For instance, the goal of adding bus shelters and enhancing accessibility is to change travel behavior. So this could be seen as a TDM strategy as well. You really don't need to remember the categories. What's key here is that once you identify the root cause of congestion, you have a few different ways of approaching the problem. That's great. So Wow. I just have to say, wow, that was a lot to think about. Yeah, it's great that there's a ton of options out there, but it does take a bit of time to absorb. To help you think about how all this applies to you, here are a few questions to reflect on, keeping your community and region in mind. Do you have a traffic operations center in your region? Are the traffic signals synchronized, even across jurisdictional lines? Does your MPO incorporate TISMO and TDM strategies in their plans, projects, and studies? Are there parts of your community where it would be beneficial to slow down traffic? Do you set aside money in your tip for projects that address congestion? Make sure as you go through these lessons, you reinforce what you have learned by talking with your MPO staff. Don't hesitate to reach out to AMPO or NARC with questions or feedback. Oh, hey, Wayne, I mentioned a number of studies and articles and all kinds of transportation plans and projects during this module. If you want to take a closer look at anything I mentioned, links to each source is listed in the description of this video. Great, Taylor. Thank you so much. We've talked a great deal about the different and innovative congestion reduction measures out there, but where does an MPO fit into all of this, you may be asking yourself? Well, in the next module, we'll delve into an MPO's role in congestion mitigation and what you can do as an MPO board member to help your community. Thank you for watching.